and gentlemen, here she is, the hilarious Kathy Griffin. tonight I am telling you we're going to talk about everything from of course we're going to have to talk about Oprah and the Kardashians and the housewives and I okay first of all let's just <laughs> Miley is at it again Miley Cyrus <laughs> is at it again it finally she's getting married finally <laughs> what is she 19 20 look here's the thing I hope to God Miley gets married in the Daisy Dukes. I mean it. Miley's latest new favorite outfit is also mine. It's Daisy Dukes and a crop top. Super classy and of course some combat boots to take it home. She's gonna marry the hot guy from the Hunger Games and yes, I know you love him gays and ladies and I know you straights have at least heard of the Hunger Games. So we're right on track. All right, now look. I um, am very excited about Miley's upcoming nuptials because I'm hoping she becomes a teen mom as soon as possible. <laughs> we have seen photos of Miley Cyrus in a new kind of Daisy Duke, and I think this is exciting. So, so far we've seen her in her typical Daisy Duke, which I'm almost sure has given her an infection. <laughs> if any of you ladies have had a UTI, it is unpleasant. No, it hurts. It is like being stabbed in the pussy while someone with combat boots <laughs> kicks you and takes it home on your clit. Does everybody know this isn't Blue Man Group or The Lion King? Are we all, because I mean, I know this is a nice theater. So I don't know if she's gonna wear Daisy Dukes to her wedding. I hope to God she does, because, um, because that would be some funny shit, and I like when she puts them with cowboy boots and then a top knot. Uh, oh, I have to tell you some behind the scenes about when Anderson Cooper was on The Kathy Show. Anyway, uh, you know, he, he was like maybe a little bit uncomfortable about me bashing the Palins because he's like an actual journalist and stuff. And so I promised him I wouldn't say anything bad about the Palins. So when I called um, Willow a dirty <laughs> um, he just went to his safe place, and I'm not even kidding, like his body got smaller and he just curled up and they ended up actually editing it out of the show. So that's why you're here tonight, for all the things that they cut out of the show. But I can say here, in Long Beach, I don't know if you've seen a little gem called Life's a Trip on Lifetime, but trust me, even if you haven't seen it, just, I mean, I can't believe I'm pro Palin in any way, but I am telling you to watch this f***ing train wreck. But anyway, the premise of Life's a Trip, get it? Life's a Trip, because she named her kid that she had with my ex-boyfriend Levi, Trip. So that kid could be mine. I'm not even sure. I really, there's, we need more DNA testing. That could be my baby, I'm not sure. Sometimes my pussy goes missing and I'm like, call me, girl. <laughs> Did you ever have that? Did you ever find that when your pussy goes missing and you're like, where have you been? She's like, I don't want to talk about it. So, oh, my pussy and I fight all the time. Be honest, I don't want to be honest. You fucked that guy. I didn't mean to, I shouldn't have. <laughs> we talk. We talk, we go back and forth. Um, speaking of pussy and the Palins, um, any 
anyway, there's this just ridiculous reality show called Life's a Trip, and it's all about Bristol Palin and her struggle and strife, of which she has neither, and how she leaves the throbbing metropolis of Wasilla, Alaska, which I have been to. It's a fucking shit hole. Stay here. Stay here. You're all way better off just staying here. Everybody's cool. Um, and she decides to move to Los Angeles at the, on the advice of her mother, of course, Sarah Palin, and her mom is in full hair and makeup at a campfire making s'mores, saying delicious bone mows like, I think you should move to LA. I mean, what's the deal there? Find out what the deal is. She can't pronounce the word deal. It's just funny to me. I could listen to her talk about a deal breaker all day. And then Willow moves to Los Angeles, and she's got the hair extensions. And let me tell you, I'm not above it. Some of this grew out of my head. And some of it fell from gay heaven, where a winged gay man just put fairy dust on my face and made magic hair happen. The gays will make magic. We've all seen it and love it, and where would I be without them? So hi, gays. Hi. Straights and sleep. All right. Um, <laughs> now, I just want to say, just off the grid, I just want to say, finally, we're making some progress. And I, for a sitting president to go on record and say that he is pro gay marriage is such a big deal. And I just wanted to take a minute and get what a big deal that is. Gee, I don't know why I'm like making fun of the Palins, and for some reason that made me think, oh, we have an actual like thoughtful president who went to Harvard and is pro LGBT rights and gay marriage. <laughs> What's the connection there? Because Palin would never fucking get it. Now, um, <laughs> she just wants to make sure that we stand strong with our North Korean allies. Did you hear she said that? <laughs> Genius. Okay, so. So here's the deal. After all the presidential elections, et cetera, it turns out that the Palins really just want to be the Kardashians. And I wish they would have told us that from the beginning, but really, she just wants to wear a Valentino jacket and have fabulous hair and makeup. And Bristol, you know, unfortunately named after a vacuum cleaner, apparently. Um, <laughs> She just wants to move to L.A. and hang out at the Saddle Ranch like everybody else in America. Oh, did you see Bristol Palin calls the Saddle Ranch a restaurant, which I thought was pretty genius. So anyway, the premise of the show is that um, Sarah is saying, what's the deal out there? You should, you should move to Los Angeles and spread your wings. Okay, first of all, Bristol is 21, and then she, um, Sarah advises that she take her younger sister Willow with her to babysit Trip. Now, here's the thing. Willow is 17, Bristol is 21, and that chin implant has got to weigh her down. I mean, you cannot check that. You got to put that in the carry-on. And I love that she has had the face work, as you know I have. But um, Bristol talks a lot about moving to California and how everyone is so image conscious here, not like in Wasilla. In the meantime, she's got the fucking magic hair and the chin implant like Jay Leno. She might actually sit in for Jay. Nobody would know. Um, so, so she uh, moves to California with Willow, but I'm just telling you, in my opinion, the real story is Willow. So she's the 17-year-old younger sister of Bristol. And I'm whispering so you don't tell anybody in Corona Del Mar. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm thinking. Um, or don't tell any of those crazy bitches in uh, the OC Housewives that coded a casa. All right, we're going to get to those nutbags in a second. But the point is that Bristol Palin and Willow Palin have a reality show. And I'm telling you, the one to watch is Willow. Now, I am not saying that at 17, she's done porn. I am saying TikTok. All right, so um, I was protested by the infamous Westboro Baptist Church, WBC to picket infamous f hag Kathy Griffin. So anyway, I do, I do love being down here for many reasons, and I am sort of obsessed with, I've actually never been inside the, I call it the compound where the housewives of OC live, Coda de Casa, I think it's called which I think means code of the casa. I don't know, but I, um, you know, I shouldn't just sit here and promote all things Bravo, but I can't help it. The OC women still fucking deliver. And this year, I'm even more obsessed with the one known as Jesus Barbie. All right, so 
Let me take you inside. When I run into these bitches, they are not happy with Mrs. Kathy. They are not happy with this whole package. Because, you know, they don't have a sense of humor about themselves, and they all think they're Meryl Streep, and it's pretty f***ing funny. But, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. NeNe thinks she's Meryl Streep. Let me tell you, NeNe from Atlanta is like, move over, Glenn Close. It's me, Meryl Streep. <laughs> with my Louboutins. Anyway, um... Gays, you can't put up with that for one more minute. They can't even pronounce the name of their f***ing shoes. So, so anyway, she uh, also, they had, they had an episode of Housewives of OC where they all went to Costa Rica and, you know, shocker, got into a fight. And just know, the one that says, I don't want drama the most is the one most likely to cause the f***ing drama on all the shows. So anyway, um, they went to Costa Rica and Jesus Barbie was bragging about the trip. And she said, and you know I'm not making this up, Costa Rica is in Mexico. I didn't even change, like, I didn't even have to in, there's no punchline. Costa Rica's in Mexico. Cut, got it. Thank you. Everybody go home, we got it. Thank you, Alexis. Another excellent day at the office. Hola and buenos dias. Um, so, so yeah, so under the guise of Jesus Barbie being very religious, and a lot of those chicks are very religious, supposedly, and I am what you call a non-believer. I don't even want to say I'm an atheist, because frankly, I don't want to join their club either. But the point is, I am a fallen Catholic, I'm not religious, and that's all well and good. Of course, not with your own Maggie Griffin. She's, God damn it, Kathleen Mary. Quit making fun of the goddamn church, for Christ's sake. Why do you say all those nuns are lesbians? They're not all lesbians. <laughs> Maybe that one sister married, but we never saw her play softball. <laughs> glug, glug. All right, so... So anyway, I love making fun of groups, religious groups in particular, because they seem to have the worst sense of humor. And I, of course, you know, I, I get it. I hear from people when they're offended. I have people walk out of shows constantly. I don't think anyone's walked out yet, which means I haven't done my job. Um, She recently was uh, protested, and that's not like that big of a deal because, you know, it's America and we get to protest, and that's what's great about it. So I was protested by the infamous Westboro Baptist Church. I know, I know, Long Beach, I know. All right, so if you don't know, and like I said, I hate to give them publicity, but on the other hand, you might find it to be funny. So this is a group that is so heinous. It's about eight toothless rednecks that are probably related. So. You don't really have to be afraid of them. They're not a real force, but they really are hate-filled. And um, they're the ones that protest the funerals of kids that have died of AIDS. And they have signs that say God hates f and AIDS is the solution, not the problem. And they protest military funerals, which is obviously very egregious and also kind of confusing. And so um, I can see why they might protest me because I'm, you know, big proponent, of course, of the LGBT community, and I'm pr proud of it. Proud of it. The military funeral thing, even I don't understand, although, you know, I've performed in Iraq and Afghanistan, so I guess they made that connection. And by the way, we have some vets with us here tonight, so we want to thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you for your service and your loved ones. They're heroes as well. We thank you for what you do. I don't know how you do it because you're so incredibly brave, but we thank you for what you do. So. So anyway, I find out I'm going to be protested by this group, and I went online and I looked them up. I found out that they also protested uh, the Foo Fighters when they performed there, and I couldn't figure that out. I was like, why would they, you know, protest a rock band? So I have a dirty little secret, which is I'm friendly with their singer, David Grohl. So I... <laughs> Straits, wake up! It's your section, Straits! Hi! Hi, it's me! I saw at least four straights get excited. What? <laughs> I love that. I love, I love the foo, foo foo. Yeah, I know. Anyway, when I found out I was going to be protested by the Westboro Baptist Church, I called David and I said, um, how did you guys handle this? Because when they protested the Foo Fighters, the Foo Fighters did this very clever thing, which is after the show, they got a flatbed truck, dressed up as rednecks with mullets and trucker caps and actually serenaded them and sang a rather scathing song about them to them. So, I then, 
I admit it got the better of me, and I decided to go online and read why they were going to protest my shows, and they protested two of them, and what their issue was with me, so I brought it with me today. Uh. All right, WBC to picket infamous <laughs> hag Kathy Griffin. she does her filth in Kansas City. I love filth. I mean, <laughs> frankly, they're two for two at this point. Griffin uses her platform. Ooh, I didn't know I had a platform. I'm gonna run for office. Head bitch in charge. Um, her platform to promote sodomy at every turn. It's interesting because they have not watched all my specials because in one of them I specifically say that for me personally, my butthole is an exit only situation. <laughs> for me personally, but I say to the gays, slap on a condom and some lube and have at it. <laughs> Griffin also worships the military. Okay. Of the doomed America instead of the sovereign God, Jesus Christ. I'm not super Jesus-y, they got me there. <laughs> her career offers plenty of opportunity for her to tell a large audience, I'm kind of liking this whole thing, they're making me sound really famous, oh sorry, a large audience to obey the commandments of God and repent. Yeah, not tonight. Um, I'm not gonna repent for shit. you don't have to repent no repenting here tonight pussy jokes a little fisting that's it that's it's not a big repenting crowd you know what I mean um, all right instead she loves to blaspheme God well I learned from the master god damn it Kathleen Mary Jesus Christ Almighty! Peter, Paul, and Joseph, and Mary, and the baby Jesus. You and your goddamn swearing frankincense and myrrh. Um, she loves to blaspheme God as she enjoys the pleasures of sin. Every chance I get, baby. Every chance I get. Till I'm sore. Hi, Daddy. I don't know what rehab for whippets would be like. Is it that they put you in a room filled with whipped cream and you have to see, like, how many you can pass up before you just go, ah, suck on it? Like, all right, can we talk about the new Oprah? I know, we've discussed Oprah many times, I get it, but let me tell you, there's a new Oprah in town. Now, since she's done the daytime show and now the own network has, you know, tens of viewers, I don't care about that part. <laughs> I still love her, I'm still a fan, but here's what I love. So, OWN has, you know, Masterclass and Oprah's Next Chapter, and let me tell you, Oprah's Next Chapter is a f***ing pisser. Now, in this show, she goes to other people's homes and she goes into their worlds, which she hates. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you saw the interview with Steven Tyler, she looked miserable the whole time. And it's just great. In these interviews, like if you saw her with the Kardashians, which I really never thought I would see in a million years, is her stooping to the level of the fucking Kardashians. That had to be a bitter pill in Gail's ass. <laughs> that had to hurt. That had to hurt for Oprah to be like, I'm talking to the Kardashians! <laughs> you guys, she has given up on life. I am telling you. Right? She looks like 
She doesn't have the Oprah Barbara Walters lighting. She, you can see her eye circles, poor thing. She shows up in a fucking sweatsuit. She's got a nappy wig. That is the nappiest wig I've ever seen. I am telling you, that is not the beautiful Oprah wig that I grew up with that was beautifully styled by her hair man. No, I am telling you, there was a dead cat in the road. She said, put it on. I mean, I don't even think Gail combs them anymore. I'm like, Gail, run your fingers through that wig. It's your girlfriend. Act like it, goddammit. Um, but yeah, when she was talking to Steven Tyler, she looked like she was afraid for her life the whole time. And there's, you know, the thing I love about, about Oprah is you want to try to catch that moment. It's a very Wizard of Oz situation. You want to go behind the curtain just for a second. And so when she went to Steven Tyler's house and she got in his car, she, you could tell the whole time she was like, slow down, Steven. Slow down. Don't drive me fast away. I'm all brought out. So that was fun. But there was an unex sort of an unexpected moment. And you know, Oprah seems very much in control all the time. And so she's interviewing Steven Tyler, of all people, who looks fucking nuts. He's got the fringe and the scarves and the bell bottoms and the velvet and the outfit. And then they go to commercial break, but they still roll the camera. And you can tell she's fucking checked out. She is checked out, bored out of her mind. If you saw the Kardashian one, she acted like she didn't even hear Kim Kardashian say she went on birth control at 14 which even for a whore like myself was a little fucking young. Um, and I'm pro whore. I want you to know I am pro whore all the way. Yes. Am I just, now me? All right, now you. All right, so I'm all for whoring it up. I really am. But I, it was funny when Kim Kardashian was trying to act like she wasn't put on birth control that young. So Oprah saying, what age did your mother put you on birth control? And, and Kim, who's like a spark plug of personality. Um, and then Kim, of course, has that Kardashian voice, which I'm obsessed with, like that cadence that's very specific. I'm very bored with everything. Are you serious? Like, literally, are you literally asking me that? Like, seriously? Are you literally being literal right now? Seriously? Literally? Courtney. All right, so, so then it was great when Oprah said, how old were you when your mom, Kris Jenner, my idol, um, put you on birth control, and I love when Kim goes, I was almost 15. That'd be 14, bitch. You were 14. I'll see you on Teen Mom with Miley and Amber, and everybody's going to jail with Janelle, so settle in. So anyway, Oprah's talking to Steven Tyler, and then it goes to commercial break, and you could tell Oprah was checked out. So she's looking at her blue cards, and Steven Tyler is kind of still in the moment, right? And he seems nuts. And so Oprah's just like, uh-huh. That's right, Steven. <laughs> All right, Aven. So what she's not noticing, you gotta YouTube this, what she's not noticing is that he has taken off his shoe. Did you see that? And he's like, yeah, this is what the road will do to you. The road and drugs. She's still not listening. And I'm at home like, fucking listen, he's gonna say some crazy shit. <laughs> Pay attention, Gail. <laughs> so, it turns out his toes, he has like snaggle toes where they're all like mangled. Did you see that? So his toes are like that. And he has his shoe off. And he's trying to show Oprah and she isn't paying attention. And I'm thinking, girl, this is the time to look up from your sweatpants, put away that salmon sweater and lights up, honey. And so, so finally she notices his crazy toes and his, his story is that it's from years of like singing like this and going like that. It really added up. Anyway, so you just hear Oprah going, oh my God, look at your toes, Steven Tyler. And so let's talk about another one who's back as if nothing ever happened. Yeah, we're gonna talk about Demi Moore and some whippets. That's right. I. You know, look, I am trying to be with the kids and with the trends, and when I read that Demi Moore allegedly went to rehab for whippets, that's some funny shit to me. I don't know what rehab for whippets would be like. Is it that they put you in a room filled with whipped cream and you have to see, like, how many you can pass up before you just go, ah, 
and suck on it like I am super obsessed with all the new drugs because I feel like, oh, I'm so mad at Tiffany. I'm like, Tiffany, it is your job to keep me in with celebrities and the drug trends. Now get me some f***ing Cool Whip. <laughs> I want a can of whipped cream right now. And I actually said to, uh, to uh, Tiffany one night, I said, Tiffany, you and I should do whippets because that's what all the celebrities are doing. And she said, I don't think you can mandate that your assistant does whippets. And I said, yes, you can. It's in the state of California. Handbook introduction to Team Griffin section. <laughs> anyway, so I go, just go to the store and let's get two whipped cream cans and we'll figure it out. And this was after the Demi Moore situation. And so I have two whipped cream cans in front of me and I don't know how to do whippets. So I shake one of them and then I just have a little whipped cream. That was good. Um, <laughs> I didn't get high, but I was like, oh, whipped cream. I just remembered Thanksgiving. It's good. Um, and then I took the cap off and I thought like something would like fly up like a like I dream a genie and I get high. So I was like looking at a can of whipped cream for a while. Like, do you feel anything? No. And so I, I still don't know how you do whippets. And so we bailed on the idea and we just had pumpkin pie. It was it was a fing mess. But I want to do the trendy drugs that the kids are doing. The one I also love is Sizerp because um, I, I like the rapper T.I. He was on my life on the D-list. I respect his work. He um, is not always, you know, at his home. <laughs> Sometimes he's, you know, in a different building. <laughs> All right, so anyway, he was in prison. And then, and when he got out, I just thought this was comical. You gotta laugh. So he and his baby mama, uh, Tiny, were driving down the Sunset Strip in a Maybach which is basically a way to go, look at me, look at me, look at me. And um, they got pulled over after he was on parole. He actually went back to prison for this because in the cup holder, they had a, an In-N-Out Burger cup of Sizerp. The, here's why this is funny to me. That guy is rich as f That guy has a lot of money and many Grammys and gold records. So I was fast. I'm like, what the f is Sizerp? So apparently it's codeine cough syrup, and then you mix it, I don't get it, with Jolly Ranchers and Fanta? And let me tell you, I'm going to do some bath salts tonight if it's the last thing I do. Yes. I am fascinated. Okay, so now, you know, I stay in hotels all the time because of touring and I love doing it. But now they're hiding bath salts in hotels, which I think is awesome. Because now you can only steal the little soaps and the shower caps, but the bath salts are like under lock and key. And now I'm afraid to call down and ask for bath salts. Because then they'll, I don't know what, call the FBI? I don't, I don't know, but it reminds me of, you know how you can't like buy cough syrup anymore without feeling like a criminal? That's some funny shit that in my lifetime, you can't go to the Rite Aid or the CVS, and if you want coughs, if you have a cough, it's now behind the counter, and they want you to show ID. So I go, I'm like, I, I can I have some cough syrup? And they're like, oh, we need some ID. I'm like, well, first of all, here you go. Um, <laughs> That was like a share moment I had. I had like a little share accidental, don't you know who I am moment. All right, wait, I'm gonna get back to my drugs in a minute, but let me digress because I have to, I have um, breaking share news. So, and I know you like it. I know you like it. First of all, what's really funny is I just got a text from her about a half an hour ago that she can't make the show tonight. You don't think that's funny that she called me now? I couldn't find a helo pad. All right, so, um, <laughs> So anyway, I've said it before, but if you don't follow Cher on Twitter, you really need to, because she twats all through the night like a vampire. <laughs> and it's hysterical and genius, and I still don't think she knows the difference between tweeting an email or even like a phone call. So I was on tour in Atlanta recently, and then all of a sudden my twat blew up, and if I turn my phone on and I get a ton of twats, I know like something's happening with a celebrity. And so I see that Perez Hilton has tweeted that he wants to have a kiki with myself, Cher, and the group The Scissor Sisters. And a kiki, of course, based on their song, and it means like a kind of a sit down, let's, you know, I'm losing my religion, I need to talk until I've reached the end of my, it's a, a coffee clutch, basically. So. 
Anyway, I just think it's funny that Perez Hilton thinks I'm just going to drive him to Cher's house. Like, that's how she rolls. Like, I am thinking, if you think Cher knows who the Scissor Sisters are, you've never met her. And here's why. She, have, she and I have something in common, which is we really only like kind of older people and people that have really earned it. You know, that's why I hang out with my 92-year-old mom. She's f***ing earned it, you know? I... Frankly, like, I'm not interested in anybody under 90 at this point, but Cher also, she's like not really that interested in the up and comers. You know, you gotta kind of earn it with her, and she thinks Madonna is like a brand new artist that just won American Idol. Um, so I made a joke on, like, uh, 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 in one of my shows that, you know, if you think Cher knows who the and Scissor Sisters are, trust me, they haven't earned it yet. All right, so then I find out that she's furious with me that I have implied that she doesn't know every cool group. So now she's agreeing to a kiki with myself, Perez Hilton, who she's never met, and the Scissor Sisters. So she then tweets, because I think she thinks it's email, she actually tweets, at Perez Hilton, at Scissor Sisters, let's make a time. My place in the boo or in town. You and Kathleen make guest list. Only cool, discreet peeps. <laughs> really? So now I'm on tour in Atlanta, and now I'm hosting a kiki with Perez Hilton and the Scissor Sisters, either in the boo or town, whatever the f that means. So. <laughs> So I send her a text and I'm like, Cher, I don't, do you know that you have basically put it out to millions of people? Like you're gonna have people outside your house, fans and shit. And so I said, just, you know, it's on Twitter. It's not like really like a phone call. And then I said something, made some joke about like, look, I'm on the road, I can't deal with this. I'm doing a couple, I'm doing two shows in Atlanta. All I'm trying to get is a good donut. So then, <laughs> She tweets back, once again tweets, which I think is hysterical. You talking about donuts, bitch? <laughs> I don't know, Kathleen. What does a donut cost? I have my own personal donut, man. I'm f***ing share. I did something that I think might be um, unprecedented in the history of the Grammys as far as a uh, nominee. I stole someone's seat. Um, I do want to give you the inside scoop because this year I was a, for the fourth time, the fourth year in a row, a Grammy nominee for Best Comedy Album. And I just want to say, last year I did four comedy specials in one year, which has never happened. No female or male comedian has ever done it. And I was like, God damn it, I'm getting a Grammy nomination. Because you know the deal, right? You know that I can't go to award shows unless I'm nominated. Oh, this is real. Unless I am nominated for an Emmy, I am persona non grata at all award shows. <laughs> Trust me. So I've been able to go to the Emmys only as a nominee. Uh, I got to go to the Grammys where I lost again, but at least I got to go. And uh, although I will tell you the one that was a bitter pill, and that was that I was... Um, a nom I was nominated for the People's Choice Award again this year, second year in a row, but wait for it, I lost to Kim Kardashian. <laughs> All right, now what I learned from the, going to the People's Choice Awards is that um, I had a good seat, but I was in the middle of the row. So I learned that what is most desirable is to have what's called an on-camera aisle seat. Now, when I was at the Peeps Choice Awards, I was in the middle of the row, so I didn't get to participate in any of the Hollywood bullshit that I enjoy during the commercial breaks. So I'm sitting there, bitter as hell, I've lost to Kim f***ing Kardashian, and then I have to look across the aisle to see Neil Patrick Harris and his husband kissing other celebrities, talking about their f***ing gabies, and I'm like, oh, why am I always in the wrong place? So, so I was determined that when I went to the Grammys to get a goddamn on-camera aisle seat if it was the last thing I did. So I will tell you, I was the first person there and the last person to leave, and I'm sitting there looking at all these incredible artists, and I'm on the red carpet, and there's Stevie Nicks, and there's Katy Perry, and there's Bruno Mars, and, and this is just f***ing exciting, right? So I finally get inside, and I see that I have a good seat, but it's not on the aisle. So while I'm watching all these celebrities walk by, I'm very excited. Um, I did something that I think might be um, unprecedented in the history of the Grammys as far as a uh, nominee. I'm not proud, I'm not, I'm not proud. I stole someone's seat.
That's right, you're damn right. This is so sick. Now here's the problem. The problem is I've been around too long. I've presented at these shows, I've lost at these shows, I've hosted these shows. So they all know me. So it wouldn't even occur to any of these poor ushers to think I, at 51 years old, stole a Grammy seat from an actual nominee. It was pathetic. So I sit down and the ushers are like, hello, Miss Griffin. And I'm like, hello, I'm a nominee. I don't know if you've heard. And they're like, mm, okay, whatever. Um, so the great thing was, by the way, that every time Adele won, which was every five seconds, when the camera would do a reverse shot of Adele, I looked like her plus one because I was right in front like this. I loved carpooling with you, Adele. All right, so. I was across from Bruno Mars, who was great because he was a sore loser, and that's my favorite kind of nominee. And because when you lose, you know, you're supposed to be gracious. <gasps> no, every time Bruno Mars lost, he was like, <sighs> and I was just fan of the fire, so I was across the aisle just going, oh. <laughs> you were robbed. That sucks. All right, now. I will tell you that when I took my seat, my stolen seat on the aisle, uh, Dave Grohl was seated a couple seats away from me, and he just gave me the suspicious look like, you're not supposed to be there. <laughs> I can pretty much tell. And I was like, be cool, be cool, don't f us up. <laughs> so I was maybe getting a little too excited to see celebrities, but I will tell you, it was so charged, and I think I was the most excited person in my section, seriously, because what you should know is that, like, the first 15 rows of the Grammys are Hollywood music people that are too cool for the room, and it's actually the quietest section. Behind that, all the fans are excited, but I love every moment where I'm supposed to be acting like a celebrity that's got everything under control, but let me tell you something. I'm gonna try not to cry. When Lady Gaga walked past me, I sort of queened out. I did. I queened out. I wasn't cool. Nobody else, you know, made any audible sounds. It was a lot of very famous people. Lady Gaga in, I believe, a brass dress walking past me. But she stands alone. And me just going, oh my god, fierce! <laughs> Diva! <laughs> like that. It was. Not cool. Katy Perry was like, take it down a notch. You're at the <laughs> Grammys. <laughs> it was bad. All right, so, so then the moment came that I feared the most, which was um, the person showed up whose seat I stole. I just want to say, this was not my proudest moment, and I don't think I handled it properly. I'm just going to be honest about it. Here's why. Um, it was a country singer named Eric Church who was an actual nominee. So this was his seat. He deserved the seat. He had a ticket that said it was his seat. Mine was mysteriously missing. And like I said, all these ushers know me, and so they were genuinely perplexed and came up to me and like, Miss Griffin, we're so sorry. There must be some kind of a mix-up because Mr. Church has a, a ticket for the seat. And I don't know what came over me. I don't know why I didn't say, oh, you know what, I just wanted, you know, a better seat. I'll, I'll move. I decided to turn crazy-er and <laughs> just stick my heels in and be, that is appalling. This is certainly, of course I would not take so much. That is ridiculous. I don't, I'm a nominee for best comedy album. <laughs> All right. I look at Grohl for help, and Dave Grohl's like this. <laughs> right, David? No. You're on your own. All right, so, so they actually made this poor guy, Eric Church, wait in the hall for a whole segment while he was like spinning, trying to figure it out. It was so bad. So then the guy shows up again, like, no, Miss Griffin, we really, we're so sorry. We really think this is his seat. So I was like, well, then I'll move for now because I love America. Like, it just made no sense because he's a country singer. So I'm not saying it made sense. I'm just telling you what happened. So anyway, then, Eric Church, who, by the way, shouldn't have been late. 
in my opinion. So anyway, he shows up with his wife or girlfriend or whatever, and then his category comes and goes, and he loses, and I certainly know that feeling. And then he freaking leaves, so he was only there for like 10 minutes. Well, let me tell you something. My ass was back in that stolen seat in two <laughs> seconds. I actually have a new and improved, very recent fan letter from my biggest prison fan that I would like to share with you now. Let's cut the crap. Men fall in love with me. I can't help it. I can't help it. It's, you know, it's more of a curse than a blessing, turns out. Anyway, um, not all of the men who fall in love with me aren't um, incarcerated. <laughs> so I actually have a new and improved, very recent fan letter from my biggest prison fan that I would like to share with you now. It starts like this. Hello, Kathy. As always, I pray that you are well, and I wish for you massive success in this year and the many more to come. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> he seems super sweet. I don't know why you're so judgmental. It's been quite a time in here, and that's why I haven't wrote in a while. I was happy to see you briefly on CNN Live. You look great. You're so crazy and hot. I heard your New Year's resolution to swear more and eat more junk food, LOL, but junk will swell up your trunk. <laughs> now, I feel like he thinks I'm fat, you guys. I feel like we're in our first fight. And then he, I think he tries, like he realizes, you know, and guys realize they f***ed up, so they're like extra sweet. If I had you in my bed, I would have breath the next day, and your ass would have smelt minty, fresh, and tingly. I'm going to go ahead and reread that to make sure you really got where he was going, because it's called romance. Fellas, you might want to try it. If I had you in my bed, I would have breath the next day, and your ass would have smelt tea, minty, fresh, and tingly. Now, I believe, I'm not a romance novelist, I believe he was alluding to licking out my hole. Don't be jealous. And then he goes on to say, and I guarantee it would not stink for a month. It's been lonely in here for me. Hmm. But stuff does go on here in prison that's funny. Uh-oh. And I love, like, a funny office story. You know what I mean? Like when Jenkins, who's two cubicles away, puts a lampshade on his head for the Christmas party, and you're like, Jenkins, you are too much. I had no idea. So I'm pretty sure it's like that. One day, a man got caught with three cell phones up his ass. Right? Remember? Like when Johnson from Accounts Receivable got caught with the three cell phones up his ass, and you're like, Johnson, how many times have we talked about this? Totally relatable. He forgot to turn the ringer off, so the guard heard his ass ringing. 